Well, good morning, Rexdale Alliance Church. My name is Michelle, and along with the rest of the team here, we want to welcome you to our service and invite you in. We are in week four collectively of great lifestyle changes because of COVID-19, and in week four of trying something new for our church gathering together. This week, I was reading from Psalm 90, and Psalm 90, the opening of it says this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were formed, before you brought forth the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And this is true of us as we meet together in this new way. God is still our dwelling place. And so together we're going to worship him, we're going to pray, we're going to give, and we're going to listen to God's word together. And uh, because this is an online forum, we encourage you to interact with each other. And you can do that through commenting, um, through the comment section in Facebook. You can ask a question, you can send a word of encouragement, you can dialogue with each other. Um, and we encourage you to do that throughout the entire uh, service, our time together. As you might know, we are also at, um, at Palm Sunday. It's a Sunday on our Christian calendar when we remember that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and he knew what lay before him, the cross. Um, and as he was riding into Jerusalem, the people praised him. They cried out for him to be King, Messiah, their savior, but he didn't come as they expected him to. He came humbly and gently riding on a donkey instead of a chariot. He came knowing that they didn't understand what they were praising him for and yet graciously rode through. And he rode on knowing what lay before him, that it would take a great sacrifice, the sacrifice of his life to be their Messiah, to be their Savior King. So this is a day where we celebrate both hope and exclamation that God is a God who saves us. And also we recognize the heaviness and perhaps the desperation that Jesus felt knowing the price it would take to be Savior. Um, and they cried out the word, they used the word Hosanna. And um, the word Hosanna means both a cry of, Lord, please save us, and an exclamation, God, you are the one who saves us with confidence. Perhaps you're feeling in between both of those poles of emotion in this season where it's very difficult for us right now. Perhaps you are feeling moments of great faith and exaltation and you know that God is our savior. And perhaps uh, you are feeling the heaviness and you feel more of a cry, Lord, please save me, help me. We're going to use our worship time to express all of those feelings to God. And we can do that through worship. The songs that we're going to sing together um, are Two of them are songs you know really well, and they both are songs that declare Hosanna. The first one um, declares Hosanna in an, in, in an exultant way. You are the God who saves us. And the second one, more of a cry of, God, would you be our savior? We want to see your salvation still. So I want to encourage you to worship through these songs with your family. Um, and the third song is definitely a song I don't think most of us know, um, but it's a beautiful song about being broken, and each of us can relate to that. We're living in uh, a little time here where our systems of norm, or norm, nor what's normal is broken, and our systems are broken. And we can feel our own innate brokenness better at that time, at these times perhaps. And um, so this song talks about um, allowing God's grace into that brokenness, asking him to fill us, make us vessels of grace. Um, and he only can do that. So I want to encourage you to listen to that song together as a family. And when we finish worshiping together, uh, we're going to continue our service. Solomon is going to share with us a scripture. Um, and then the worship team is going to share a poem um, that unpacks some of the meaning of Palm Sunday. So we're going to invite you to pause and to worship together and then come back and join us. Thanks.
Good morning, church. So glad to be able to connect with you this morning as we continue to worship our living God and celebrate Palm Sunday. My name is Solomon, and I would like to add my welcome to that of Michelle's this morning. As we continue with our worship service, we will be reading from the scripture and read Luke's account of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. I will be reading from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 44 from the NIV, so please follow along if you can. The Triumphal Entry After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell him, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Now, please listen to members of our worship team as we present a Palm Sunday poem. Thank you. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you. Jesus comes to the gate, to the synagogue, to houses prepared for wedding parties, to the pools where people wait to be healed, to the temple where lambs are sold, to gardens beautiful in the moonlight. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you, to new, to new subdivisions subdivision. and trailer parks, to penthouses and basement apartments, to the factory, the hospital, and the cineplex, to the big box outlet center, and to churches with a message unchanged from the beginning of time. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city, the city nearest, nearest you, you, with his, with good, his news good news and hope erupts, joy springs forth. The very stones cry out, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowds jostle and push. They can't get close enough. People running alongside, flinging down their coats before him. Jesus, the parade marshal, waving, smiling, paparazzi elbow for room, looking for that perfect picture for the headline, the man who would be king. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you, and gets, gets the, the red right carpet, carpet treatment. Children waving real palm branches from the florist, silk palm branches from Walmart, palms made with green construction paper, hosannas ringing in the churches, the chapels, cathedrals, and monasteries, basilicas, and tent meetings. King Jesus honored in a thousand hymns in Canada, Cameroon, Calcutta, Canberra. We love this great big powerful capital K King Jesus coming in glory and splendor and majesty and awe and power and might. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you. Kingly, 
he takes a towel and washes feet. With majesty, he serves bread and wine. With honor, he prays all night. And with power, he puts on chains. Jesus, King of all creation, appears in state, in the eyes of the prisoner, the AIDS orphan, the crack addict, asking for one cup of cold water, one coat shared with someone who has none, one heart, yours, and a second mile. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest us. Can we see him? Our church family and friends, welcome to our online service. We are happy that we can connect. And also, if you are new to our online service, we are happy to have you. We are hoping that you have been receiving our update newsletter. Please, if you don't receive it, just let us know. Thank you to all who have given in the past couple of weeks, whether online through pre authorized our new interact uh, transfer option or just good old snail mail your offering are providing for the church needs and enabling us to carry out ministry in this a challenging time in the new different ways we also wanted to let you know that uh, our share hope goal is 80,000 we raised 46 and we're hoping to reach the 80 thousand uh, dollar donation for the share hope will be open until easter sunday next week today is a balm sunday and while i was thinking about this week and the holy week is coming the balm sunday when jesus was entering jerusalem he was going to the the city of peace jerusalem but he was bringing peace to everyone there. The people were desperately looking for the Prince of Peace. Jesus, while he's entering Jerusalem, the crowd cry out to him, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Hyatt. Hosanna is a Hebrew word that means, save us. Can we come together crying and asking Jesus to save us? We need your help save us not us only but the whole world is really desperately need the prince of peace to bring the peace to our heart heart and our mind and that's what we need during the COVID 19 and after i invite you to pray with me for this prayer and we need to come together please pray wherever you are now for this prayer let's pray for those who have COVID-19 let's pray for protection for the frontline workers and also let's pray for wisdom for the leaders of the church city denomination and countries all over the world let's pray for the opportunities that we have to share the good news during this time Let's pray for the peace for the hopeless world and let's pray also to the comfort for those who have lost their loved ones. Please join me in prayer wherever you are now. Thank you. 
join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We come before you, Lord. We come as a church, we come as a family, we come as individuals. Come before you, asking your help. And we come crying out to you, Hosanna, save us. Lord, the COVID-19 is spreading too fast. And we pray that you come and intervene to stop this virus. And Lord, COVID-19 brought us as a world before you. And we come before you and just confess that we have nothing to do. We cannot do anything. So we come to ask your help. And we trust that you are in control. Nothing will happen out of your hand. Lord, come. Come, Lord, and save the world from what's happening. And let us keep our eyes fixed in you. Father, we pray. We pray to come and comfort everyone. Especially the people that lost their beloved one. And we pray, Lord, for Bob Tugans losing his mom. And for Bori and Lake Shami losing their sister. And for Shirley Sermantu losing her sister in the Philippines. And we pray, Lord, for Linda, Desert Legs, losing her father. Father, come to our brothers and sisters. Just to give them peace and comfort their heart by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we know that you are the great doctor and you are the healer. We come before you to put in your hand, Sister Melodia, Melodia de Lemendo and Lisa Masset. We pray for them, Lord. Touch their bodies. Heal them and give them the strength they need. And Father, we know that you are here for us. You never forsake us. You are the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So we come before you. Come, Lord, and help us. We need you. And we know, Lord, that you're listening to our prayer, that we are committed in your hand. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Again, it is a privilege for me to come into your home as we continue in our worship experience in these unique days. Again, even though we are separated and I know we would long to be with one another, 
I am reminded of the, the fact that the promise that Jesus made that where two or three are gathered in his name that he would be present with them and so the two or three of us who are gathering in our homes uh, can be assured of the presence of Jesus. Today I'm going to be wrapping up this series on sacred practices with a practice that we don't normally associate, I think, with spiritual formation. And that is the practice of joy. And so let's look at the scriptures together and uh, see what God may want to say to us. But before we do so, join me as we pray. Father, we're delighted to be able to be together in this way. We acknowledge that we are in days of uncertainty days of uh, perhaps uh, anxiousness and wondering what is in store. But Father, we thank you that in the midst of our uncertainty, you bring your peace. And indeed, the scriptures remind us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so we ask that we would be strengthened today by considering this whole topic of joy and how we find joy in the life of Christ and what he has done for us. And so we give ourselves to you again for uh, these moments. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mark Buchanan, who is a pastor and author and is actually on uh, staff at the seminary at uh, Ambrose University in Calgary, speaks of a time and tells the story of his wife's grandmother catching gold fever. She lived in an area of British Columbia where men had come during the gold rush days hoping to stake a claim. And in her middle years, in the late part of the 20th century, men with lingering hopes of striking it rich still made their way to dredge up what they could from the river silt. One day, Buchanan writes, Grandma Alice was in her backyard polishing a large stone. It was a boulder that sat across her garden, too big to move. It was one of those stones, round and smooth, tumbled by eons of wind and ice and water, thickly embedded with glittery chunks of mineral. She was polishing it with sandpaper. Her logic was that since she could not get rid of the thing, she may as well beautify it try to remove the dullness on its surface and hone it to a lustrous sheen. She was going to make it the centerpiece of her garden. But she got more than that. As she sanded, she noticed a thin sifting of gold gathering on the stone. She pressed the moist tip of her finger into it and pulled up a caking of gold dust. Her heart raced. She sanded faster and faster, leaning her whole body into it and making and more gold appeared. She caught the contagion in one swoop. She understood with perfect instinct what all this time she had dismissed as sheer nonsense, grown men squandering all else, homes and farms and families and reputations and flinging themselves headlong into reckless escapades, spending their years burrowing beneath tree roots grubbing through silt beds. But now she had it too, gold fever. She was going to be rich. She stopped a moment to wipe her brow, to rest a spell. And that's when she noticed that something was wrong with her wedding ring. The top side was normal, but the underside, the part that nestled in the, in the crease where her finger joined her palm, wasn't. The band there was thin as a cheese slicer wire, thin, as a filament. She had nearly sanded her wedding ring clean off. All that gold was merely filings. It was the remnant of her heirloom. It was her treasure reduced to dust. It was fool's gold. How often has Grandma Alice's story been reenacted in people's lives, in my life, in yours? We get this thought that a certain pursuit will unpack for us the way to joy and happiness, the realization of the goodly life, the means to fill the cloud with whatever we have wanted in order to download whenever we choose, only to discover that we have fooled ourselves by misguided hopes. This was the misconception of the crowd who welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem on what has become known to us as Palm Sunday the day we are actually celebrating today. 
They saw Jesus as being the answer to their being worn down by the oppressive rub of the Roman occupation. With eager anticipation of Jesus mounting up and defeating all competing rulers, they shouted and cheered, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The word Hosanna is a Hebrew term that essentially means save now. With nationalistic fervor, the crowd called out for Jesus to save them from the tyranny of Rome and restore Israel to the glory days the nation had known under their much-loved king, David. However, in just a few days following the crowd's enthusiasm for the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, would their enthusiasm would be worn into cheese-wire-thin disappointment by the press of the Jewish religious leaders. Their shouts of praise would give way to angry slurs, and their hopes for deliverance would be brutally snapped by the crucifixion of the one who was to be their ticket out of oppression into joy-filled existence. The magnitude of this misunderstanding was not lost on Jesus. And as Jerusalem comes into view during his descent from the Mount of Olives, he breaks into weeping. He bemoans the fact that their expression of praise does not reflect the true joy that he has come to bring. Jesus' way to finding the joy that sustains comes from devoting ourselves to something greater than personal happiness. It calls for the release from the charm of consumerism and calls us to be present to the one who weeps over our lack of celebrating the pleasure of God he brings to us. It is for this reason that I have included this talk on joy as part of the Sacred Practices series. Far too often when we think about disciplines for our spiritual formation, we think of what we need to give up in order to be present to the presence of Jesus. And there is much to be said about this viewpoint. However, in doing so, it can become easy to overlook the celebratory practice of joy in shaping our relationship with God. When Jesus made his way into Jerusalem, surrounding by, surrounded by the cheering crowds, he was well aware of what lay before him. In a few short days, he would be falsely accused, brutally beaten, and publicly shamed through crucifixion. And yet the prophet Isaiah, along with the writer of Hebrews, spoke to the satisfaction and joy that his death on a cross would bring to Jesus. This points to the fact that before there can be pleasing sacrifice, we must learn the practice of joy. Joy is central to all of the sacred practices. I would like to look at an encounter that Jesus had with a man who by the standards of the pursuit of happiness that set Grandma Alice wildly polishing what she believed would bring her a fortune, would have every reason to be blissfully content. He had the wealth and power to fulfill whatever he delighted in. However, in reality, he was alone and disillusioned and went looking for Jesus. Only Luke, who as a physician would have insight into the emotional health of people, includes this event in his account of the gospel story. Here is the scriptural account found in Luke's gospel, chapter 10, verse, chapter 19, rather, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too 
is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. The thing to note right from the top in this incident is that through Jesus, Zacchaeus found the joy of salvation. He came to discover his heart's greatest longing and how he could be delivered from his inability to meet it. From his reaction, it can be concluded that he found a depth of joy that totally transformed his life. A closer look at the story reveals that Zacchaeus had a good thing going. He is identified as a chief tax collector. This would mean that Zacchaeus had developed a pyramid scheme where he received a cut from all the tax collectors that he had recruited to collect taxes for him. As a result, he would have become, he would have become very wealthy. As Jesus makes his way through town, Zacchaeus has a passionate desire to see him. He has a particular interest in catching a glimpse of this man who had invited a tax collector to become one of his closest companions. You see, Jesus had sought out and called Levi, known to us as Matthew, to join his band of followers. Levi had been a tax collector. And after he had been invited to follow Jesus, Levi threw a party for all of his tax collecting buddies to which he had asked Jesus to come. And Jesus accepted his invitation in spite of all of the criticism he received from the religious leaders who couldn't understand why he would do such a thing. Word about this gets around. Jesus parties with tax collectors. One of his friends and followers is a tax collector. Zacchaeus wants to get a look at this man who hangs out with people like him. There was, one, there was something unusually refreshing about Jesus. He couldn't, he couldn't help, he couldn't keep from wondering what made Jesus different from the other rabbis he had gotten to know. Before we can engage in the practice of joy, we need to be captured by a throbbing wonder of who Jesus is. There is a fundamental connection between joy and wonder. For Zacchaeus, his wondering about Jesus presented him with a problem. He was vertically challenged and couldn't see above the heads of the crowds that had gathered to watch as Jesus passed by. As he ran back and forth on the sidewalk, trying to elbow his way to the curbside, the people put the squeeze on him. Tax collectors were despised and no one was going to give way to him. So Zacchaeus settles on a plan. He catches hold of a low-lying branch of a nearby tree growing at the side of the road and pulls himself up into it. There, perched on a tree branch above the crowd, he hopes to see Jesus. Wonder doesn't just happen by accident. It involves planning. It requires persevering. It grows through practice. It flourishes in patience. It never tires of reputation. It delights in God. G.K. Chesterton links the enjoyment of wonder to the abounding vitality of a child who wants things repeated again and again. With unrelenting enthusiasm, a child says, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people succumb very quickly to monotony. Chesterton then goes on to muse. Perhaps God is strong enough to exalt monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be, automatically ne may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite for infancy. He then remarks, Chesterton then goes on to remark, but we have sinned and grown old, and our Heavenly Father is younger than we are. How easily wonder can become lost to us because we allow ourselves to become bored by routine. We become too accustomed to the gift of a new day, the beauty of a sunset, a shooting star streaking across the midnight sky, 
the excitement of a child's voice saying, do it again, after holding their hands while they do a backflip. To miss the joy of wonder is to miss out on the reason for our existence. As people made in the image of God, we are to reflect the passionate joy of our Creator. With the excitement of a schoolboy, Zacchaeus scrambles up the tree. Jesus comes closer and Zacchaeus is pleased that he has such a good seat. He may also have concluded that his position would give him a good look without being detected. Jesus is now right underneath Zacchaeus. He stops there and looks up. The crowd wonders what he is doing. Someone sees a person in the tree and makes the comment about a kid having climbed the tree. Jesus speaks, Zacchaeus, and that name sends a buzz through the crowd. Think for a moment about how Zacchaeus may be feeling at this point. He thought he was going to hide in a tree, to watch from a safe distance, to keep from becoming involved. And all of a sudden, Jesus and everyone else in the crowd knows it's him up that tree. Everyone is staring. What will Jesus do? Undoubtedly, those in the crowd are hoping that Jesus would give him a stern lecture about his corrupt lifestyle and tell him to change his ways. That would be what the crowd would want to hear. Give this guy a stiff rebuke and set him straight. Crowds are good at this. The crowd mentality is to point fingers, to condemn, to criticize. People hide in crowds, just like Zacchaeus was trying to hide in a tree. They hide from God. They hide from themselves. They go with the flow. There is safety in numbers. Zacchaeus, Jesus says, and the crowd is straining to hear what is sure to come next. Will you get out of that tree? I need to talk with you and it's hard to carry on a conversation with you sitting up there. Now hurry, come on down. And then the words for which no one in the crowd was prepared and Zacchaeus least of all, I must stay with you at your house today. Imagine that instead of Zacchaeus up in the tree, it's you. You are afraid and lonely and disillusioned by what you thought would bring you happiness and contentment. The possessions, wealth, dreams, and relationships that you had put your hopes in just aren't doing it for you. You long to see Jesus, and yet a part of you is afraid. Imagine you are in the tree, half hoping Jesus will see you and half hoping he won't. If Jesus were to come along today and see you up in the tree, what would he need to talk with you about? What is it in your life you are likely to hide? What isn't working for you? What is robbing you of wonder and stealing away joy? Notice how Jesus responds to Zacchaeus. He doesn't ignore him or disassociate himself from him. He stops. He looks into Zacchaeus's eyes. He speaks to him. He befriends him, even before Zacchaeus becomes respectable. And Zacchaeus responds. He comes down from the tree. He takes Jesus up on his request and welcomes him, him into his home and into his life. He admits that he is lost, that he can't find his way when it comes to contentment and security and hope and happiness and joy. He stops his game of hide and seek. The link between joy and being found by Jesus is made. Joy comes to those who admit their need of God and come out of hiding to be found by him. The story of Zacchaeus tells us that God is into finding, not hiding. That he does not play the hide and seek game where he hides from us and makes us search him out. He initiates the finding. He lets us know how he may be found. And when we find him, he intends that we live so abundantly that our charity becomes obvious to all and they are drawn by our infectious joy into his presence. Robert Fulgham, in his book, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, says that his guess is that God does not engage in the game of hide and seek, but is into sardines, 
where the person who is it hides and everyone looks for him. And when you find him, you hide next to him until everybody is hiding together and giggling so loudly that their location is no longer a secret. I think God is a sardine player, Fulcan writes, and will be found in the same way everyone else gets found in sardines, by the laughter of those heaped together at the end. Zacchaeus was giddy happy with having found Jesus. And the results of his discovery soon became apparent throughout the place where he lived by the demonstration of joy and gratitude. What howls of protest came from the crowd as Jesus walked off with Zacchaeus to go to his house? Luke tells us that they were indignant. He has gone to hang out with a crook, a disgusting sinner, they muttered. And the cat calls rose from the crowd as Zacchaeus and his newfound friend walked away. But Jesus ignored their condemnation and fearlessly pursued the purpose for which he had come, to seek and save what was lost. G.K. Chesterton has written, The way to love anything is to realize that it might be lost. For Jesus, this meant loving the unlovely, touching the untouchable, associating with the disenfranchised, partying with the sinful. The problem with the crowd was that they were more spiritual than Jesus. It is always a misguided zeal when we surpass Jesus with our spirituality. Zacchaeus, helplessly lost and sin-bound, was only one sincere confession away from intimacy with God and life in his forever family. He was lost but was found. He was shunned but now accepted. He was insecure, now he can live with assurance. He fruitlessly pursued happiness, now goodness and mercy followed him wherever he went. Jesus is about changing lives. He is not into shunning people who are different, disadvantaged, disenfranchised, or distant from him. He is eager to bring transformation. And so Zacchaeus, knowing that he is a sinner but loved by God, receives Jesus' embrace and gives up on his self-centered means to security and happiness. He says he will pay back anyone that he has cheated four times the amount that he has wrongfully took. The legal requirement was simply for him to pay back the actual amount that he stole along perhaps with a 20% fee. But he didn't stop there. In addition to making restitution for his wrongful acts, he says that he will give half of all of his possessions, those things upon which he had identified, had based his identity as a happy and successful person to the poor. Zacchaeus takes his stand against greed and selfishness by showing generosity. He has found the joy that comes from a grateful heart. As the story of Zacchaeus ends, Jesus gave what easily could be identified as his life's mission statement. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. This mission statement now becomes the defining purpose of the followers of Jesus. Joy for the followers of Jesus is found on mission. God is up to something transformational. He is into radically changing lives as the story of Zacchaeus shows. The truly intriguing aspect of God accomplishing his mission on earth is that he invites you and me to be an integral part of the completion of his mission. Zacchaeus caught that and immediately set about making a difference to the disadvantaged and restitution with those he had wronged. And he did so joyfully. God's great objective for this world is to generate an immense community of people from every nation, language, ethnic background, and social economic status who get it when it comes to delightfully living on purpose. Brought together as a living community, these people will form a thriving dwelling place for God and become the means for releasing his holy intentions for all of creation. Like some giant electromagnet 
the missional engagements of God's people in the world draw those who are away from God into a joyful encounter with the Lord of life. Joy comes to those who discover that God is on a mission and intentionally join him in advancing his mission in the world. This brings me to address the necessity of joy for spiritual formation. When it comes to the place of joy in our sacred practices, I think we typically underestimate its value. Joy is a strength, and to neglect its practice can create weakness. At a strategic time in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, when the people were overcome with grief and sadness, Nehemiah called them to the sacred practice of joy to release them from their feelings of failure in keeping God's word. He informed them that in the midst of their sense of weakness, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah's instruction informs us that without joy, we descend into a weakened state of spirituality. Failure to attain a deeply satisfying life under the gracious provision and pleasure of God has the effect of making sinful actions look good. Forming practices that promote a strength of joy in God is an absolute necessity for healthy spirituality. Here is the key for spiritual vitality. We must increase our capacity for celebrating the pleasure of God so that sin no longer looks good to us. So how do we arrange our lives around this practice? Well, let me give a few suggestions. First of all, make a start. Now, the first step in the practice of joy is to simply begin, to determine not to put it off. The crowd shouted, Hosanna, which means save now. There is an immediacy associated with introducing joy into our life's practices. If we wait for the perfect moment when we are feeling like it, we will never learn to rejoice. The psalmist makes this point when he wrote, This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Then engage wonder. Increase your capacity to see and feel joy in the simplest gifts of God. Don't allow the monotony of routine to dull your senses to the mercies that are renewed towards you each and every day. God is constantly up to do it again. He never tires in extending his favor upon us. We just don't always notice. For we have sinned and grown old, and our Heavenly Father is younger than us. Thirdly, find a joy mentor. It may be that you would consider yourself to be joy challenged. You find yourself sliding into complaining much more than rejoicing always. Proverbs 15.30 tells us, A friendly smile makes you happy. You probably know someone who exudes a joyful presence, who is a breath of fresh air whenever you are with them, you, who make you smile. Seek out their company. Tell them you are trying to break out of your joy-impaired living. Ask them to pray with you that the joy of the Lord would become your strength. And then finally, be a joy model. Jesus told his followers, that they would experience joy, but not just any joy. I have told you these things, Jesus said, so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. It is this overflowing joy that Jesus intends for his followers to demonstrate in a cultural environment where sadness and despair so often rule the day. The joy that Jesus calls us to is not something we make up on our own. It is not the silliness that we so often think we need to display to make those around us happy. 
It is the overflow of the easy yoke of discipleship that Jesus calls us to. It is remaining so intimately connected to Jesus that his joy-filled persona naturally shows up in us. And so we have now come to the end of our study of sacred practices. For sure, I haven't covered all of them off. However, it is my hope that our study will have become a new beginning for you in finding the rest of God in your daily experiences. That learning to slow down and ruthlessly eliminate hurry will take hold in your lives. That Sabbath and solitude will be the first order of your day. And finally, that joy will become your strength. And so here is my prayer for us all. O God of ancient days, we rejoice in your eternal presence. You never grow weary in extending your favor towards us. Day after day, you provide us with good and perfect gifts for our well-being. We marvel at your loving care. However, we acknowledge that your faithfulness can become routine to us, leading us to take it for granted. For we have sinned and grown old and neglected the practices that renew and sustain us. Forgive us for our failure to live at the pace you have made for us. Help us to find our rest in you. For you alone are just and true, and your word is life. Transform us by your truth, and empower us by your spirit to bring your life-giving way into our homes and communities, so that hope and salvation may abound and the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. Amen. Just to indicate you would have received in the letter that was sent out, the email blast, that we are planning to have a Good Friday service. However, this service will take on a bit of a unique characteristic. I will be doing a live Facebook feed on Good Friday. And in that, I will be inviting you as families or with those you are with to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so we would encourage you to be in prayerful thought about this and prepare yourselves for this receiving of uh, the Lord's Supper together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the constant companionship of the Holy Spirit Guard your hearts and your minds and fill you with everlasting joy. Amen.